I want to share an interesting conversation I just had about net neutrality, specifically some of the technical motivations, both, both for net neutrality as well as against net neutrality. Um, and if you're looking for just an overview of net neutrality, this is maybe not the right video to start with. Um, I would recommend uh, a quick video from CGP Grey, which I'll link to somewhere over there. Um, and I have to say, I generally agree with the sentiment in, in that video and, and actually many of the, the similar videos that are out there that, that kind of give an overview of net neutrality. Um, but I was recently chatting with, with friend and fellow YouTuber Grant from the channel 3Blue1Brown, which, by the way, you should definitely check out. He does a phenomenal job of explaining all sorts of complex mathematical concepts and in a way that, that will really make anyone love math. But, but anyway, we were talking recently about why, if it seems so obvious that net neutrality is such a good thing, why is it so contentious? Um, so anyway, we decided to record the conversation. It's totally unscripted, uh, so if, if we got any details wrong, um, I'm sure you can read all about it in the comments. So I definitely think I can play the role of someone who kind of knows what net neutrality is, but still has a lot of dumb questions to ask to help you maybe illustrate it for people, but honestly, okay. just for me. Right. Uh, so <laughs> can we just kind of get a broad overview? What What is net neutrality? I'm actually curious what you think net neutrality is, because I, I think okay. it, it's one of these... Me on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot. Because it's one of these things that I think... I mean, there's a lot of videos, there's a lot of things out on the internet that talk about it, and it's slightly different depending on who who you're listening to. Okay, my understanding is if my computer asks a server on the internet for a packet right now from someone, right. that when it goes through the routers and like my internet service provider to me, mm -hmm. um, it is not like it's not allowed in some legal sense to uh, offer more resources, more routing resources towards packets from some service versus packets from another service. And instead it has to be completely neutral to where they're coming from or what data they consist of in terms of the resources that that router and that the internet service providers resources get allocated yeah. to. Yeah, that's, that's where, pretty good, pretty good. Where am I wrong? I think, I think that's actually a pretty good definition of, of net neutrality. Is, we're done. We're done, yeah, we're, we're done, done. yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> so I, th no, I think what's interesting is, is the question of whether you actually want that. Why wouldn't you? Suppose that you are requesting a bunch of packets from the network that are harmful uh, to, to, the, to the network at, at large or, or cause harm to your neighbors, let's say, that, that use shared infrastructure on the network. What's an, like, is this like a virus type thing? What's an example of me? So I think, so I think a good example um, is something that actually happened, which was um, when BitTorrent came out, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, Comcast was limiting um, or, or in some cases blocking, in some cases actually um, aggressively shutting down uh, traffic. Can you give a little overview of what BitTorrent is and why it's distinct from other sure. things so, people might be familiar with? Yeah, so BitTorrent is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system, which is, um, so if I have a, a large file that I want to share with a bunch of other people, um, I can create a little piece of information, put that on the internet that says like, hey, I have this file, you can come to me. Um, and there's a tracker that sort of tracks who, who has pieces of that file. And originally it's just gonna be me. You can connect to me and you can start to download that file from me. And then other people that wanna download it can connect to me and you, <clears throat> download part from me, part from you. And as more and more people download the same file, they become part of this uh, you know, shared distribution so that when you know, an additional person comes along and wants to download that file, they could connect to potentially hundreds of people that all have that file and download a little piece from each. Um, and the nice thing about that is that uh, the constraint is no longer the end-to-end -end connection between a server and a client, but it is the, essentially just the connection between the client and that client service provider because from that point, they could be pulling in from multiple different sources. So as long as all my neighbors have the movie that I want to bootleg, then... Well, it could be your neighbors, it could be other other people uh, on different parts of the internet mm -hmm. uh, that are connected to different providers, uh, you could pull down all sorts of pieces of that. So there's a couple of things that are um, unusual about that. One is, you know, one, you're downloading a large file, which, you know, that's fine. There's lots of cases, use cases for that, and internet service providers know that people will occasionally want to download large files. Mm -hmm. um, so they engineer their networks to, to support that. Um, but what's different about this is once you've downloaded that large file, you're now serving that large file and if it's a very popular file, and, and one of the um, biggest use cases of this was, um, you know, uh, you know, stealing copyrighted movies, so very large files, mm -hmm. lots of people want it, sort of a black market type thing. Um, 
and, and everyone's, everyone's downloading pieces of that. And so once you've downloaded that, you're now a server. And so you are now pumping out uh, copies of that file kind of as fast as you can. And that's harmful in the sense that it's costing you more? It's costing the internet service provider more because they have, they have made the bet when they engineered their network that you're going to be uploading and downloading occasionally, mm -hmm. sort of in a bursty fashion. And this new protocol, when it, when it you know, sort of became popular, now meant that you are downloading continuously and, and uploading continuously. Mm -hmm. um, and their network just wasn't engineered to, to support that. And, and so the assumptions that they made about um, you know, being able to aggregate your traffic with your neighbor's traffic um, it, um, no longer held. Okay, that makes sense. And so now what you're doing is, in the one sense, harmful to your neighbors, but in the other sense, you probably feel some you know, sense of entitlement. So, well, I'm paying for this connection, mm -hmm. I ought to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's you know, a reasonable thing to think. And th this is an example you were pointing out that an ISP in the past has... So Comcast violated. actually did this. So, they, yeah. so what, they, what they did is they said, okay, this is harmful to our network. Most of our customers aren't using BitTorrent. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that are probably are using it for illegal mm. movie sharing and things. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, there's, there's legitimate uses for BitTorrent. Um, but you know, they sort of made the assumptions, not many customers, uh, it's not the bulk of our customers. If we slow this down by you know, identifying what traffic is BitTorrent traffic and throttling it, mm -hmm. or <laughs> one thing they were doing is they were actually sending, they were injecting uh, packets that terminated the connection Oh really? And spoofing the source address of those packets. Really? And so it would shut down. Yeah. Huh. So they were doing that to just like aggressively just stop BitTorrent right. traffic. So it's um, not just like it's not constraining the pipelines for that particular service. Right. It's they're just aggressively just like attack. trying to get it off the network. It was an attack. Yeah. It was an attack against their customers in, to, in a sense. To back up to where when I gave a definition, I definitely wasn't positive. Is it a legal thing? Net neutrality is that something that Comcast is required by law to abide by? So the net neutrality is this concept that is essentially what you described, that packets shouldn't be differentiated or slowed down. There shouldn't be, you know, they talk about this fast lanes versus slow lanes. So mm -hmm. some traffic's throttled, some traffic's not, or some traffic is, um, you know, queued more uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, generously and so forth. Um, so it's sort of this principle. And um, there have been attempts to uh, put it in regulations. Okay. And so the FCC made several attempts to do this um, that were challenged in court. and ultimately um, overturned by the, the DC Circuit Appeals Court hmm. that, that said like, you can't do this the way that um, internet service providers, the regulatory framework that they're in, um, the FCC can't, can't actually enforce these net neutrality principles unless they were to recategorize internet service providers as, as um, Title II, um, which would then sort of categorize them as a public utility. Because I really don't know a lot here. Yeah, yeah. What are they currently categorized as? Well, actually, they're currently today. Right. I mean, in a couple of days, we'll see. But today, they're currently categorized as, as Title II, okay. um, and so that was something that was a, a few years ago. Okay. Um, the FCC did, but prior to that, they were categorized as Title I, which meant they're information service providers. They weren't. Um, they weren't like public utilities. I recognize I'm revealing a certain level of ignorance and even asking that about what is going on. But <laughs> hopefully, that's reflective of a couple of people watching, so that it's kind of the. Questions it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty ask. wonky. <laughs> right, right. But so that very likely could change. Yeah. So that'll, it's very likely that they're, they're going to go back to this Title One, um, where you know it, it essentially can't be regulated. So the we, courts. at the time when Comcast was treating BitTorrent differently, mm -hmm. that was that was legal. That was that was legal for them to do. That was legal. It was kind of sketchy. I mean, I, I would I would say it's kind of sketchy because they were. Well, I mean, they were spoofing packets, they were yeah. shutting down connections, uh, and they weren't telling anyone. That um, feels like a slippery slope thing, right? Like, you can start with that with BitTorrent if you want. Sure. There's a certain trust that everyone using Comcast then has that that's the only... Right, like what else are they spoof. shutting down, and what are yeah, and what other things? And, and there's cases of, um, yeah, I think AT&T, for example, this is on, in the mobile space, um, you know, they, they prevented, uh, I think it was FaceTime, from working on iPhones. Hmm. Or, or maybe Skype. Actually, I think both on different occasions. Um, so, so these voice over IP applications on the phone, AT and T said, "Yeah, you can't use that on an AT and T iPhone because we would prefer you to use the phone it's service." It's straight up competition. It's straight up competition. Or, or, yeah, or and you're like, well, instead of getting the thousand minute plan, I'll get the five hundred minute plan, and I'll use this voice over IP, and I'll yeah. pay less. And and so and so AT and T said, "Yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna allow that traffic." 
And again, that's that was legal. That was legal. And then right now, no. today. To, today. Yeah. Uh, December, what is it, 11th? What is it? Yeah, it's December 12th. 12th. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's not. And then potentially December 15th. 15th. <laughs> that could become legal again. Okay. And so that, that's kind of what's, what's at stake here. Here's what I want to hear from you. Um, I feel like if you're on the internet and you're at all familiar with net neutrality, every single person is telling us, like, it is a good thing. This is, uh, there is no question about it. Right. It is only for purely nefarious, evil incarnate reasons that anyone would ever vote against net neutrality. Right. 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 If I was to ask you to just put on your devil's advocate of devil's advocate shoes here and actually kind of voice a, a reason that someone would not want net neutrality, does that exist? Is there a case to be made? Yeah, there, there is. Um, and actually, the BitTorrent one is, a, is an interesting example because okay. on the one hand, it sounds very nefarious. They're shutting down this traffic. This is things that users want. Um, but they were, I think Comcast, when they were doing that, they were looking at this as, you know, we are trying to protect the vast majority of our customers. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you are the one person in your neighborhood who's um, you know, using BitTorrent, you could be, um, you know, sort of choking off the service to all of your neighbors. It could mm -hmm. be you know, 200 of your neighbors who are sharing the same bandwidth in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you're using all that up because the, the assumptions that they made when they engineered the network is that no one would be doing that. Um, so here I am trying to just like watch Netflix or something like that. And because some neighbor of mine is BitTorrenting and just uploading and downloading way more than anyone expected them to, I'm right. just getting crappier service. And right. That's, Right, okay. and, and so and so the thing that Comcast would then need to do to remedy that would be to expand their network capacity in that neighborhood, and someone's got to pay for that. Right. So that would mean the bill for everyone in the neighborhood goes up, so that the one person who's who is like way off the charts in their usage mm -hmm. um, gets the same service. Um, hmm. So, th so this or they push you into another plan. Right. Now this. Well, why isn't that the case, right? Why isn't it that the person who's just uploading, downloading way more than usual, that his bill is enough to to foot the extra costs that this is this is incurring on the ISP? Yeah. So this is tricky because you're. Let's say you're paying for a hundred megabit per second uh, mm -hmm. connection. Your neighbor's paying for a hundred megabit per second connection. Mm -hmm. Comcast is engineering the network with the assumption that you're not. Not everyone is going to use hundred megabits per second at mm -hmm. the same time. So. There's a sort of a <clears throat> uh, there's sort of a lack of understanding on the part of consumers as to what they're actually buying when they buy that 100 megabit per second connection because they're not actually getting guaranteed 100 megabit per second. Every single neighbor was trying that at one moment. You're not going to get it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, now you can buy dedicated internet uh, access, mm. uh, and it'll cost you about a thousand dollars a month, mm. and that's with a three-year contract and. Uh, it's very expensive to actually get 100 megabits per second. Because you need guaranteed infrastructure. Because you need guaranteed infrastructure to carry that, yeah, exactly. Um, so that's very expensive, and so you probably don't want to pay $1,000 a month to get 100 megabits per second. You'd probably rather pay $50 a month to get 100 megabits per second most of the time. Why yeah. would the solution then, I mean, obviously I'm asking you to make this devil get a, a yeah, yeah. Devil, devil's advocacy case, but why would the solution be to violate net neutrality as opposed to just making it transparent to people? Like, your plan is 100 megabits per second, Except if you were legitimately using that for like 12 hours of the day, like there, there's some kind of cap on right. like how much you can be exercising that maximum rate because realistically you're not expected to and they should just be forward and honest about that rather than... Yeah, that's, a, that, that's another approach uh, that they, they could take and I think it, there, was, there, has, there has been discussion about that. I mean, consumers basically don't want caps. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. The idea that you'd have a cap um, of you know, 500 gigabits per month or so, I don't know, whatever kind of cap you might have. Um, you know, consumers kind of want an unlimited service. Or we want to believe we have. You want to believe you have an unlimited service. It's essentially guaranteed that we'll never exercise that right. need. And the, and the, you know, the, the one or two people way off on the, on the end that are, that are abusing, uh, the providers would call it abusing. Mm -hmm. I, I think the customers would say they're using what they, they're paying for. Um, but the ones that are really off off the charts, you know, the provider's like, yeah, we'll just limit the traffic. We'll give them, we'll slow them down, um, or slow down the applications. Um, BitTorrent, so, not to interrupt, but BitTorrent seems like an interesting example, just because this is a peer-to-peer -peer type thing. And then there's a whole pile of hype around decentralized 
possibilities with like blockchain and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent that that is an aspect of the future of the internet, that you have a little bit more um, possibility for some services to be decentralized in this way. And I think there's even a lot of things that just have a straight up BitTorrent type flavor uh, when it comes to file sharing and things of that sort. Like, do you see that as a little bit more on the horizon? And would you see that as an example of like potentially harmful harmful things that come about when you are very strict about net neutrality, about abiding by it? I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as peer-to-peer. -peer. I think the... I also, I understand what yeah. you, you're not saying that it, it's like necessarily dangerous to abide by it strictly. I'm sort of eking that out of you, but... No, I, yeah, I, don't, I mean, I think the thing, the thing that happened with BitTorrent, and you know, maybe we're going a little bit too far down that rabbit hole, but the thing that happened with BitTorrent was this was an unusual thing. This was an unusual new phenomenon mm -hmm. on the network. And at the time, it was causing problems, um, and the providers chose to deal with it in a particular way that once it became public, you know, the, looked pretty bad. Um, and, and arguably was bad, and, and, and you could say, well, if you want to introduce new technologies and, and you want them to be successful, like you kind of need the providers to be able to step up and and deliver those those packets mm. fairly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's like, well, how, you know, is there some cost to innovating um, or, or some cost to introducing some new protocol? Is there? I mean, so that, that's one example. That it seems kind of compelling in its own way, but like, compelling which way? I'm actually curious. <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard even in a devil's advocacy way, a case for where um, violating net neutrality might be an okay thing to do, right? And in this yeah. case, it's, it's still not clear. It's and not I, like I think, I mean, there's a strong argument that that's not an okay thing to do yeah. because there's the BitTorrent users that are like, hey, I'm paying for service and I want to use BitTorrent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, why can't I do that? You know, this is this is a pipe I'm paying for it. I want to send packets, like, let me send packets. What was, more, what was compelling to me, or like maybe in the direction of that, was insofar as it's now a public cost to their neighbors, right? Right. That, right. Um, sure, they're paying for that service, but <clears throat> unbeknownst to them, they actually are throttling the bandwidth for their neighbors in a way that they don't want to be. Right. And maybe you could just say, well, like, the ISP just has to pony up and actually provide what they claim that they're providing. Right. And that um, which is going to cost more in the right. bill. It almost seems analogous to me, like um, in the case of a banking, like a reserve banking system, where like you might ask that uh, a bank has the cash on hand that everyone sees in their accounts, but realistically, that's actually just going to sort of slow things for everyone else, and you know, people. That's obviously a side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's but yeah, the oversubscription. Is, oversubscription. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, reserve system versus oversubscription. Yeah, there's there's an analogy there. So we'll call that like a sort of uh, a a partial case uh, against net neutrality. Yeah. And just because it's a lot more, I don't know, interesting. If I hear you make more cases against net neutrality, um, for the sake. Of yeah. Well, well, so uh, I think another interesting thing to talk about. It's not necessarily a case for or against. Okay. Um, is uh, there was. Um, uh, this this sort of conflict that came up between Netflix and I think it was Comcast, mm. um, where Comcast subscribers were seeing uh, Netflix slow down, um, and that was because you had Comcast, or excuse me, you had Netflix, who ha who was connected to a different service provider. Um, I think it was Level Three, mm. was the ISP that that they were using, and so uh, Netflix's servers were connected to Level Three. Um, and then, you know, Comcast's customers were connected to Comcast, and then Level Three and Comcast were connected together. Okay. And the the arrangement by which Comcast and Level Three, these two ISPs, are connected together, is sort of traditionally been a mutually beneficial arrangement, right? Because Level Three has customers, in this case Netflix. Comcast has customers, in this case their subscribers. Mm -hmm. And there's a benefit to Comcast if their subscribers can access Netflix. There's a benefit to Netflix if they can access Comcast subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a mutually beneficial arrangement. And so there's, um, you know, the, the connection between those two networks is called a peering connection because the networks are seen as peers. Um, and in particular, these are generally referred to as like settlement-free peering. Um, settlement-free meaning no one's changing, there's no money changing hands. So Comcast and Level 3 just have this like handshake agreement, like we're providing each other this thing. Yep. Hopefully the values kind of even out. Right. Okay. So if we're sending a gig, you know, a gigabit of traffic between us, I'm gonna put install a gigabit port on my router. You're gonna 
you know, pay to install a gigabit port on your router, and we're going to plug a fiber in between the two of them, mm. and we're going to send traffic back and forth, mm. and the traffic that that you send me, um, you know, benefits you, and the traffic that I send you benefits me, and vice versa. Um, and so this is sort of this mutually beneficial thing. Now, with the rise of um, Netflix and, and other like big video streaming services, you had this situation where now the traffic coming from Netflix through level three um, was significantly more um, and a significantly different character of traffic. So similar to the BitTorrent, where BitTorrent, it wasn't just that it's a lot of traffic, it, it, it's a lot of traffic continuously, mm. which is something that the network was not engineered for because it's just it's different pro traffic profile i mean i think i've heard netflix is like a third of the internet measured in terms of bandwidth and yeah. youtube is like another sixth yeah. so right there 50 percent of the internet as in the data flying around is this type of the this type of transfer and it didn't exist right until very recently right you know f you know five ten years ago mm -hmm. um that wasn't the case and so all of this traffic just like pops up because netflix and other video providers become you know very very large. Um, and so now Comcast is looking at this and it's like, well, we could upgrade this port, but you're just going to put tons of traffic on our network and we're not just going to have to upgrade the port between us. We're going to have to upgrade our network. We're going to have to upgrade um, our, our distribution and, and the connection to our scriber, subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, so if before they may have been oversubscribing, you know, we're talking about that over subscription of maybe 200 to one. So if you're mm -hmm. paying for a hundred megabit connection, um, you might have 200 customers mm -hmm. all paying for 100 megabit connection that are actually sharing a single 100 megabits. Mm -hmm. um, that oversubscription factor no longer works. Um, and so the, the infrastructure costs that Comcast would have go up significantly. And so Comcast is looking at this and saying like, this is no longer, this peering relationship is no longer mutually beneficial. Um, this is gonna cost us a lot of money. Now on the one hand, that's, benef that's still beneficial to Comcast customers because if Comcast customers can't get to Netflix, they're gonna be unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also, uh, very beneficial to Netflix because if Comcast customers can't get to Netflix, Netflix is not going to be happy. Um, so essentially that set up this kind of standoff where Comcast is like, we're not upgrading this port unless Netflix, you pay us. Ah, so this is a different, this is not them purposefully throttling Netflix traffic. Right. It's that the onus would have been on them to add a lot more infrastructure because the times have changed. Netflix and came along and, mm -hmm. and to distribute Netflix is expensive, mm -hmm. and Comcast is like, we're not paying for this ourselves. But uh, is that a violation of net neutrality? Because it's not as if they see that the packet is coming from Netflix and therefore do something different. It's just that the not, probability not directly a third of the packets coming from Netflix. And and it's um, it is a little bit discriminatory in the sense that all of the traffic coming from Netflix is coming through Netflix's ISP. Mm. And so the, the peering connection to Netflix's ISP, Comcast can say like, yeah, we're not gonna upgrade that. And so it so disproportionately they, impacts Netflix negatively. Well, walk me through that just a little bit. So because Comcast, it's making these deals not just with Netflix's ISP, but with a lot of- Hundreds of ISPs, ISPs yeah. Right? So they can, they can purposely choose to upgrade as needed or actually abide by this usual settlement-free peer exchange right. with all of the others. Or negotiate some other settlement situation. And so if there's, you know, uh, you know another connection to, let's say, Google, mm -hmm. um, who, who's, you know, sending uh, YouTube traffic, mm -hmm. YouTube is maybe less and Comcast is like, yeah, we can handle this. Or like, this is, you know, our customers want access to YouTube more or whatever decision they might make that that's easier for them they may negotiate or they may negotiate with Google and Google's like, yeah, we'll pay you mm -hmm. um, because, you know, this isn't a completely fair um, uh, situation on this peering arrangement. I don't know. All of those, all of those like peering agreements are, are private. Mm -hmm. So you, you can only speculate unless things kind of bubble out to the public. Um, so it's kind of like a higher level form of neutrality that implicit in this is that they're being neutral to all of the people they're making these agreements with. And then if one of them is serving a different traffic type, just by virtue of how they negotiate those agreements, they can treat a certain traffic type differently. Is that an accurate sum up or? I don't know that it's necessarily a different traffic. I think in this case, it just sort of, um, I think in, in any of those peering agreements, like it's always negotiated. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it turns out that it's settlement free and, and there's no money that changes hands. It's mutually beneficial to both sides. In other cases, it's not. Um, and it is more beneficial to one side than the other. 
and that's just a negotiated agreement between the two ISPs, and then money changes hands based on whatever that agreement is. Hmm. Um, and in this case, um, in this particular case that, I, that I'm thinking of, there was kind of a stalemate hmm. um, where you know Netflix kind of went public with this situation. I think even Level Three went public um, because they were you know trying to upgrade this connection and. Comcast was sort of saying, no, we, we want to get paid because this is going to cost us a lot right. you know, to support this. Now, was the, that the resolution? What ended up happening? Did Comcast upgrade? Eventually Comcast did upgrade and then eventually uh, Netflix paid. Um, it was Netflix who paid? I think so. Fascinating. I had no idea. Yeah. Hmm. What are some of the other... Okay, so that... that I guess that's not really a case four. That's just... A, th a thing that you might not have thought about that influences net neutrality type topics. Yeah, and, and you can, I mean, I think, I'm actually not sure. I think you could argue that that's not really a net neutrality question as much. It definitely has a different flavor. Because you're not, you're not necessarily providing a different um, level of service. You're just charging, you know, market rate for the transport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where it gets weird, at least... And, and where, where it sort of like drummed up some of the, the um, passions around net neutrality is that while this is going on, of course, Comcast also has their own video service, Xfinity. Mm -hmm. And that's working fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is this potential conflict of interest there where you're saying like, well, uh, you know, Comcast gets to, gets to use their own network for free. Why can't everyone else? And... I mean, is that the case you would make? Is that? Yeah, that's a tough one because I mean, you you would, you wouldn't. Because you could say that, like, I mean, Comcast as a video provider, just you know, again to kind of play that side, mm -hmm. um, they paid for the infrastructure that they need that is adding value to them as a video provider on that end, right? And then suddenly to ask that they pay for that same extra value to add value to other people as video providers, right? Right. Um, it's kind of... They also, and this, this is the other argument that people make um, who are against net neutrality, uh, and, it's, and it's a pretty convincing argument, although it's not the whole argument, so mm -hmm. just to be clear, um, there, there's more to it. But um, Comcast and other cable providers, by and large, built out their IP um, uh, infrastructures in part to support their own video products. And hmm. so a lot of the expectation when they built the infrastructure was that that would be um, paid back to them over time through their own video products. Because remember, Comcast started as a cable company. Mm -hmm. And so they were already delivering essentially differentiated service, right? Because you had cable as a completely separate service from IP. Yes, of course. And it, and it was it was not video over IP, it was just video over RF, mm -hmm. along with IP over RF on a different channel, essentially is how it was delivered. And then Comcast and other cable companies said, hey, we can save costs by getting rid of this video over RF infrastructure, get rid of all of that, consolidate on just a single IP infrastructure mm -hmm. using our existing cable plant, um, and then stream our previous video service that was you know, over RF, over our own IP network. Hmm. And the whole plan there was we'll carve out, you know, some amount of bandwidth for on our IP network to stream our video service. And so they made this big infrastructure investment with the expectation that they would be able to provide this sort of, um, you know, multiple service, it was sort of called triple play, because it was uh, voice as well mm -hmm. as video and internet mm -hmm. all on the same IP service. And so they made that investment. And, and so that's sort of the argument of um, net neutrality might stifle innovation because it was, it was this idea that we can converge our network to an IP network. Um, so in some future instance where there's going to require a lot of infrastructure investment in order to provide a totally different type of internet experience, and you're asking who's going to be paying for that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the hypothetical to think about is like if, you had, if net neutrality had been in place from the start, mm. and and then you, you you know and so you said to Comcast, okay, you have a separate video pipe into everyone's home, mm -hmm. which is the your traditional legacy cable network. You also have IP, 
If you expand your IP network and start delivering your video over IP, you need to provide that same level of service to all your competitors. Comcast may never have made that investment in the first place, and they may have kept their IP stream much smaller. Do you not think that they still would have ended up growing it because of the demand from streaming from other services? It might not have been commercially viable for other services to even start. Hmm. So you, you, like, it could be the case that the YouTube's out there and the Netflix is out there starting up. We're dependent upon Comcast and other cable providers bet that if they switch to an all IP infrastructure and, ex and significantly expand their IP uh, hmm. capacity. So 2005 internet goers like going, oh, what's this new site, youtube.com? And it's just extremely slow for them to actually see the skateboarder crash. Mm -hmm. There's like, oh, this, I'm going back to reading articles. Yeah, po possibly. It's a little, I mean, it's a little contrived to actually paint it like that because hindsight's 2020 20, almost yeah. feels inevitable that this is what consumer demand asks for and that ISPs are going to need to bend over backwards to provide it. Yeah, another interesting analogy is DSL. How so? So DSL's digital subscriber line mm -hmm. was, uh, or is, <laughs> um, uh, you know, a, a packet service over traditional copper telephone lines. So old school, 100 year old telephone technology, um, you know, dry copper pair coming into your house. You can put packets over that. And because that was part of the old telephone network, that was, that was originally regulated under Title II. Um, and so from the start, so from the, you know, from the 90s when internet, you know, residential internet was starting to, to get built out, DSL was regulated. And to be competitive, um, part of the way that that regulation worked was if a phone company builds out a DSL infrastructure to be able to provide DSL access to, to someone's house, they have to, um, what's called unbundle that, which is they have to be able to take that DSL connection from their central office to the customer's house mm -hmm. and um, provide that piece of infrastructure to competitive ISPs. Hmm. And, and so you had this proliferation of, they were called CLEX, competitive local exchange carriers, which were you know, competing with the ILEX, which are the incumbent local exchange carriers, um, that were coming in, putting equipment into you know, the traditional Bell um, central offices and offering internet access across the Bell system DSL lines. Um, and so that was, a, that was a very regulated, I mean, that was, that was net neutrality essentially. Like this DSL line is here and it is, I think there was even like a regulated price uh, that, that was that was there, um, and I think the the reason the fact that that was regulated is potentially one of the reasons that why um, cable modems um, and and things like fiber to the to the home like Verizon's FiOS uh, took off, um, and and really the, that technology grew much more than DSL, mm. because if if you're the if you're the phone company you own that DSL line, your incentive to upgrade that technology and say, well, how can we get, you know, faster encoding and, and you know, more efficient uh, and go further distances or, or build out like a hybrid fiber uh, system. It's just much lower. It's much lower because as soon as you build that and you make that investment, all your competitors have access to it to, yeah. as well. Whereas if you say, we're going to build a completely different, like Fios, for example, instead of Verizon saying, hey, we're going to build out this DSL so all our competitors can use it, they say, we're going to build a fiber network. Something that doesn't yet have the Something same rules that doesn't, applied to it. Exactly. Mm, um, yeah. And so they built that, and the cable companies didn't have those rules either, and so they really did. Um, and then I think in 2005, uh, the, the um, DSL unbundling requirement went away. But I, and so there are competitive DSL offerings out there now, but hmm. um, that wasn't an early success. So that, that's, a, that's you know, potentially an argument against net neutrality. I wonder, um, does that, is that kind of an inevitable little cat and mouse game where <clears throat> as something new comes up where there's not rules surrounding how that, as some new way to send data mm -hmm. around, right? The rules don't yet apply. And the natural market forces are going to take place before it can be treated. Well, I mean, that's what happened with the internet, yeah, and yeah, a lot of things, sure. yeah. yeah. Like, do you see that as a cycle that will continue? I mean, that requires innovation, new technologies and things. Right. So when the internet, like that kind of unleashed a lot of new technologies. So you had things like DSL and fiber and hybrid fiber cable networks and all these other things that could be explored. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, DSL, you had this strict regulation, and my hypothesis is that it wasn't successful because of that. Mm. Um, and these other, other things sort of won out. But that's because those other things existed, they were viable. Um, you know, as the, as the technology and the, and the industry matures, um, you know, you can't just pull a new innovation out of thin air. You're saying you've got to make sure that there is going to be the return on that investment for whoever puts it in. Right. And there's a risk that an enforcement, a lot of these things, like, even if it is the case that, like, uh, these should be treated like public utilities and there's a certain, like, people have the right to um, have their, each packet be treated equally. We have to acknowledge that that is a potential cost on innovation. Maybe it's worth it, but that's a potential cost. Yeah, that's a potential cost. And, that, and that's the interesting thing. I mean, there's definitely, like, I, I've been kind of talking anti-net neutrality for a while, and I don't want to... And I've got, yeah, I don't want to... And don't you, really you push, push, you push me in that direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's, and we and Ben Eater is well known to be against <laughs> net neutrality. No, no, no. Let that be his reputation that persists on the internet from this point forward. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I absolutely... It's no, I mean, there's, I mean, you could go on and on about the things. I mean, the... the um, I think you know the other example I gave about uh, um, you know AT and T mm -hmm. you know not allowing Skype on, yeah. on their phone like that's terrible. Clearly, like just uh, uh, that's anti innovation. <laughs> adversarial, right? Yeah, and adversarial, exactly. Yeah, um, and, and and then there's you know all the, the questions. I think one of the big concerns that people have is around censorship. It's like mm -hmm. you know you could have uh, your your ISPs you know, kind of making calls on what you can and can't see. And that's, that's the, the big fear. Um, there hasn't been content-based censorship th that I'm aware of, but, but that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, I mean, a lack of precedence is no... Right. <laughs> yeah, that's not comforting. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, I mean, part of the reason that it's a little more interesting for me to hear from you, because you do have such a strong background in networking and you're going to be able to speak about this more than a lot of others, like, if there's even a devil's advocacy case, is... is I think people like watching this and going around on the internet, they already know the cases for net neutrality. Sure, right? and they're all, and I don't I don't disagree with any of them. Yeah, yeah. to they're, be they're clear, all they're, they're, all, <laughs> they're all valid. Um, but in any any circumstance where there is like um, a thing that a lot of people very feel very firmly about, <laughs> mm -hmm. there's a little light bulb that goes off in my mind that says, um, should we just should we check what the other cases and and should we put aside the tendency to like go with our peers and like people that really trust yeah. and kind of give this a critical eye and say, um, you know, if someone's going against this, is it for purely selfish reasons? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a lot of the motives behind it, but you know, is there, is there maybe a little more nuance to this story? And that, that becomes a lot more interesting one because it actually becomes a more compelling way to convince people, right? If they, there's probably people legitimately against net neutrality for a couple of reasons you sure, pointed out, yeah. right? And the and the way to the way to turn them to your side is not to put a big black bar on the top of your website that's like call your congressman right now like right well it seems it seems to be effective it would be effective to get people to call yeah. to get people to call their congressman but I don't think that changes minds right hmm. I don't think acts like that or kind of internet getting the mob together to do a thing I don't yeah. think that changes minds it amplifies the minds that are already in one direction yeah. so the only way to actually change someone's mind is be very clear that you understand what the ultimate yeah. point is. Articulate it as intelligently as you can, not yeah. as a straw man. And that... Um, and there are valid points on both sides. Like all the arguments that everyone's well aware of mm -hmm. uh, for net neutrality are, are, are true. Um, the arguments against it are true too. You know, networks, there, there, is, there is value in giving networks the ability to, um, you know, to do some of these limiting things for, um, you know, network management purposes, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, allocate costs Appropriately, you know. So if Netflix comes along, maybe Netflix ought to be paying some share of the distribution costs for their product mm -hmm. because there are significant distribution costs for their product, mm -hmm. and that you know there is a concern that that's like anti-competitive. You know, there's anti-competitive, but there's also the concern that that it's anti-innovation because if some new startup comes along, they're going to have to pay that same cost. Well, I mean, but if the cost is tied to usage, yeah, then that seems fair to me. It feels like a trade-off, like. It is anti-innovation potentially on like the ISP side, the, mm -hmm. uh, like the image that you painted if net neutrality existed from the start, right? Sure. Um, and given that there's a cost that has to be incurred, it feels like whoever has to front that cost, you can always point and to whatever that industry is, say, ha, 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 it's anti-innovation for that industry. Yeah. It's like, well, someone's paying the cost. And it's just like, we got to be, we got to acknowledge 
who we are giving a leg up to and who we are forcing to pay that, right? Right. It's probably worth it, right? Like, like personally, I, I would be for net neutrality, and that seems um, like as you're allocating, okay, where do I want innovation to happen as I'm pulling the levers here and there for which ones? Um, am I okay slowing down just a little bit so that these others can like race ahead? Yeah. Um, they, they balance out, but it's not. But if you have some service like like BitTorrent, let's say, you know, BitTorrent, yeah, BitTorrent's actually a good example where there's a very small number of users who want it. Mm -hmm. Most people don't want it, mm -hmm. um, but it raises the cost, you know, the distribution cost for everyone. I feel like the, the solution there just has to be that like, that I don't pay for 100 megabits per second, no cap, that <laughs> I just like, that I'm given a cap, and then I'm also told like, this is how much you're current. Like, the ISPs would love to, to do that. I'm, am I being kind of naive here? Their consumers don't want that. Hmm. You, you don't want a cap on, I mean, I, I don't even, know. Even I mean, if you as a consumer are very aware that like your normal usage and even your extreme usage doesn't even approach that cap unless you're using BitTorrent. There's something psychological about having a cap. Mm. I, I mean, uh, my guess if mm. ISP started rolling out pricing models like that, there would be a revolt. Mm. And they know that, and that's why they don't do it, and they do these other traffic management things, or would like to be able to do traffic management to, to mm. sort of do that. But it has the negative effect, right, of tamping down something like BitTorrent or, or Netflix that mm. could become very popular. Right. Uh, so there, I, there's- I didn't really think there's like, Things like that on the horizon, more. Uh, I mean, I hope so. I hope there are cool, yeah. new, innovative things that potentially require, uh, you know, different engineering of the network mm -hmm. to support. And then, you know, then there's that question of who pays for it. Mm -hmm. Under net neutrality, it's like, well, the ISP pays for it, so it's distributed among all of the the provider's customers, even if it's a small number of people who use it. Mm. And if that's the case, then, you know, what happens? That's true. Feels well. So, I don't. I don't know how that feels actually. It feels like we've been. It feels like being faced with the truth that I don't really want to think about. Well, I think the. I mean, I think at the end, it's like it's nuanced, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why, I, if you look at both sides, so there's the there's the Title Two side, where it should be you know internet service providers should be Title Two, mm -hmm. um, which gives the FCC lots of ability to regulate them. Um, so all of the attempts that the FCC did before they were Title II were um, you know, shot down in court. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so Title II gives them all this room to, to regulate. Um, however, the FCC has not done a lot. They have not, they have not used their enforcement power. Mm -hmm. So they've kind of taken a light touch. They said, yes, you're Title II, so be careful. Mm -hmm. um, but, and so we're not gonna enforce everything we could do under Title II. Like, the FCC could do all sorts of draconian things under Title II, um, and they're choosing not to, because a lot of it just doesn't even make sense. Because mm -hmm. Title II is, I mean, it's a Title II of the Telecommunications Act of, I think, 1939 or something. So uh, it gives you some sense of how applicable it is to the internet. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, <laughs> That's like a joke. Yeah, so yeah. So it's not like super applicable. And it gives them all sorts of weird powers that lawyers could read all kinds of power into, that they could do all kinds of things to ISPs. And basically what the FCC did under um, you know, Tom Wheeler, who oh, I, I think that's right, it could be misremembering, but when, whenever they, they switched to, to Title II, they said, look, you're Title II, but we're gonna take a light touch. Mm. We have this enforcement power, but you know, you know, you know the deal with net neutrality. Um, what Ajit Pai is saying with this change back to Title I is internet service providers, like you understand the market issues, you know that the people want net neutrality, be nice, <laughs> um, but we're gonna we're gonna like loosen the leash a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we kind of expect you to, you know, to to use your your new freedom wisely. Um, I don't know that he's explicitly said that, but he he has said like, you know, we we kind of you know the ISPs have have committed to net neutrality principles, um, mm. which is kind of weaselly. It's like, well, maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Like they say they have, because like why wouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Someone could easily respond like, "If that's what's, if that's what you want to happen, what would be wrong about just enforcing that to happen rather than letting it rely right. on?" Right. Well, we're following principles. Right? right. But that's the thing. It's like both sides of it are actually kind of hedging. Hmm. So the put them Title Two, and we have all this enforcement authority, but we're not going to use it hmm. unless hmm. we need to. Yeah. Versus the we're not going to do anything, but we're going to trust them not to, not to overstep. 
Yeah, when you use the word trust and ISP in the same sentence. That... Very sketchy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's that makes a lot of people nervous, which is why people are very uh, yeah. very insistent on the on the you know a little bit tighter control. Um, my I don't know. Personally, I'm not super worried about the reclassification as Title I because the ISPs are kind of on notice. Hmm. If they go too far, the political pressure to reclassify as Title II again is going to be so strong. Like um, all people are looking for is an impetus at that point. Yeah. yeah. And it could swing national politics and, and you know, you could get another president that comes in who is more favorable. <laughs> that's the main, yeah, that's the main thing. <clears throat> like that, people have that lever. Hmm, yeah. um, and so ISPs recognize like if you know yes we have this you know they'll, they'll have this freedom mm -hmm. um uh to to potentially do things that are not completely um in line with net neutrality um but i think they recognize well i would assume that isps would recognize that if they go too far and they do things like block skype on your iphone right. um like the regulators are going to come in and come down hard on them um that's, that's my that's my hope hmm so we're just going to sit in this Mexican standoff indefinitely. Which doesn't feel bad to me. Because there's like, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's competing interests on both sides. There's value to this. There's value to that. Like, yeah. like everyone should be a little bit nervous and watching their back. And hopefully everyone does the right thing. And I mean, I don't know. It's, All right. That's how. Is, is that the conclusion? <laughs> that's how democracy works, right? <laughs> have a better understanding of the Mexican standoff we're putting ourselves in and the reasons why you might want to be comfortable with it. I mean, that's what, yeah, that's what helps me sleep at night. I don't know. All right. That's fair, honestly. <laughs> and that's different. That's very different, I think, from the take that, at least that I've heard from a lot of other online creators. Yeah. It's words. not necessarily that different to conclusions, right? You're not... You're I, don't, not I don't disagree with any, yeah, of yeah, the, any of the extreme positions on either side. I think there's... I think there's a lot of credibility to to both of those positions, which is which is why there's this conflict, right? Yeah. It's like if if it were obvious that one side were right, then we wouldn't be having a debate. Easy to lose sight of that, I think though. Shall we call it an end? Let's do it. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, thanks. It's fun. <laughs>